so, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me Well, good morning. We're so glad that you're here to worship with us at the Journey Church. We would like to wish you a very Merry Christmas. We're excited to start out a three-week sermon series beginning today. This is week one on December 13th. Here is the title of the three-week sermon series, The Wonder of the Birth of Jesus the Messiah. And week one, the sermon title is The Birth, talking about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. At Christmas time, many Christians love to head straight to the story of the birth of Jesus in the manger. This indeed is a good practice because it is a phenomenal story about Jesus' birth. The birth of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, is the most extraordinary, intriguing, unimaginable, wondrous, inspiring, loving sacrificial, adoring, worshipful story ever told on this earth. By running straight to the shepherds and Mary giving birth to Jesus and the wise men bringing the baby Jesus gifts is looking into the Christmas story with a microscope. But if we desire to learn about and read and reflect on the miraculous birth of Jesus, our Savior and Lord, it would be helpful to not just read about Jesus' birth in those later chapters, but to go back to the beginning of the story of the birth of Jesus. Let's start with a telescope view, not a microscope view, but a telescope view of the story of the birth of Jesus. Meaning, let's go back to the very beginning of God's desire to send his son Jesus to the earth to save us from our sins. But how far back should we go? Well, we need to go back before the beginning of time, before the beginning of verse history, and before the first husband and wife and the births of their children. Listen to what Paul explains to us in the book of Ephesians and Peter in the book of 1 Peter. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. Just as he chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. And then Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 20, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. And that includes you and me. We realize by these two verses of Scripture that God didn't just one day decide to send Jesus to the earth as a little baby in a manger. This was a predetermined plan of God to send Jesus to earth to save us from our sins. Because he already knew that Adam and Eve would sin and that all of the rest of mankind would need a Savior. Then, continuing to look through our biblical telescope, we are pointing all the way back to the book of Genesis. We read there about the miraculous beginning of the heavens and the earth. We read about the beautiful garden and the myriad of amazing creatures that God created and then we read about God walking with Adam in the cool of the day. Adam and Eve were so happy. Talk about a happy marriage. This was it. It was actually a perfect marriage. Sadly, we see that Satan entered this beautiful garden and began to talk to and coerce Eve to sin. And she and Adam did sin. And it all fell apart as God beforehand knew it would. As God was confronting this couple about their sin, he judged their sin. But in love, mercy, and grace, he covered their nakedness. But God did something else. He began to prophesy that his son would come to the earth and defeat Satan and sin and death. 
Let's now focus on God's prophecy about Christ's coming birth. God said this in Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 16. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. This verse is speaking of the coming Jesus one day. Verse 16, to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. As earth's history and mankind rolled along, God would continue to give a glimpse to men, women, and children that a very special birth was coming one day. Then as time continues to roll along, in Deuteronomy we see the Lord revealing the coming birth of Jesus. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 15 through 19. The Lord your God will raise up for you like me. Who's the me? Like me, it's Moses. From among you, from among your countrymen, you shall listen to him. So we see this person, this prophet, would be born from among their countrymen. And Jesus was born among his countrymen, the Jews. Verse 16, this is according to all that you ask of the Lord your God in Horeb on the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. Let me not see his great fire anymore or I will die. The people were at the base of the mountains and God in his holiness and presence came down upon the mountain and he spoke to them and it was so thunderous and so powerful and so majestic that they said, please quit talking, quit speaking to us. We can't take it anymore. Just don't talk to us. You know what the Lord said in return? The Lord said to me, they have spoken well because it is a very powerful thing to come into the very presence of a holy and glorified God. Look at verse 18. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen. Remember that? I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command them. So that's telling us we need to listen to Jesus' commands. Verse 19, it shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. Listen, church. God the Father will judge every person in the world that did not listen to the commands of Jesus Christ. Time continues to roll along. Then we hear that the Lord spoke to Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. More prophecy about the coming of baby Jesus. Isaiah chapter 7, 10 through 16. The Lord spoke again to Ahaz saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. Now boy, if the Lord allowed you to pray a prayer like that and just wrote an open heavenly check for you to ask for a sign, wouldn't you take it? Well, this man didn't take it because he feared God so deeply. He revered God and had such a respect and an awe of God. He didn't want to dare ask for that. Listen to his response. But Ahaz says, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, 
Listen now, O house of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men and that you will try the patience of my God as well? Don't we in our generation try and test the patience of Almighty God by the way we live, by the way we act, by the way we speak, and the places we go? Verse 14, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son. And she will call his name Emmanuel. This means the child born, the son born, is Jesus. And Jesus' name will be called Emmanuel. God with us. The point of the Christmas story was that God was leaving heaven in order to come to the earth to be with his children and to also lead many lost people to become his children. Now back to verse 15. He will eat curds and honey at the time he knows to refuse evil and choose good. Verse 16, for before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. Time continues to roll along. And then we hear this in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 and 6 and 7. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. It was the Jews that he was immediately speaking of there. And they did see that bright light, that star that came above Jesus. And then Jesus himself is the light. This light is Jesus Christ. Verse 6, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. This is all speaking about Jesus. Verse 7. There will be no need to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom. If you remember, Jesus is called the Son of David. To establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forever. Think about this. Jesus' rule as king will never ever, 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 ever end. And kings establishes their thrones and their kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. I'm so glad that I don't have to make sure that God's kingdom continues. I'm so glad that Jesus is in charge of his own throne and his own kingdom and his own subjects. All I need to do is to love him, worship him, praise him, obey him, and adore him, and help make him known. But to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. The passion of Christ will accomplish this. Time continues to roll along. Then we hear that the Lord spoke to the prophet Micah. More prophecy about the coming of baby Jesus. Micah chapter 5, verses 1 through 5a. This is a talking of the birth of the King Jesus in Bethlehem. Verse 1. Now muster yourselves in troops, daughter of troops, that have laid siege against us. With a rod they will smite the judge of Israel on the cheek. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you... One will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Remember, we were talking about Jesus before the foundation of the world, before the heavens and the earth were created in the book of Genesis. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity, before earth's time. Verse 3, therefore he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has born a child. Speaking about Jesus' mother Mary. Then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel. Verse 4, and he will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. And we know Jesus and John as the good shepherd. He's a shepherd of his flock. 
in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will remain. Because at that time, he will be great. And we see other passages that proclaim that Jesus is great to the ends of the earth. There's nowhere that the knowledge of the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of the birth of Jesus Christ, will not go. This one, this person, this son, this child will be our peace. Remember, Jesus is the prince of peace and he brought his peace from heaven to the earth for you and for me. Well, time continues to roll along and then we hear what the Lord spoke to Joseph and Mary. We see the prophecy coming directly to Joseph whom God will fulfill his prophecy through. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. But when he, Joseph, had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 1, 24. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife. And then we see the prophecy coming directly to Mary, whom God will fulfill his prophecy through. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Isn't that familiar to us from the Emmanuel, God with us? God is saying here to her through the angel, the Lord is with you. It's not just that the Lord loves you or that the Lord cares about you or that the Lord will heal you. The Lord is with you. Oh, church, is that not what we need to hear as believers today, as children of God today, is that God is with us. The Father is in heaven Jesus is in heaven, sitting down at the right hand of God the Father. And if you're a child of God, the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity, is here on this earth indwelling us and giving us moment by moment, fulfilling God's will to give us the Prince of Peace's peace from heaven. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great. Remember that? Remember that in the prophecy? He will be great. Micah told us that. And will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Remember, he's the son of man. He's the son of David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I'm a virgin? That's a legitimate question. The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Verse 36. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. John the Baptist was a miracle baby to Zechariah and Elizabeth. She was barren. It was known by all the women in the area that she was barren. And so God did a miracle and placed a baby in their lives, John the Baptist. And then God did another miracle and then put baby Jesus inside the womb of Mary without any sexual intercourse. It is a total miracle for these two babies. For nothing is impossible with God. Let me ask you something. This Christmas season, what's going on in your life where you need a God where nothing is impossible for him? 
Are you tired of trying to fix things yourself? Are you tired of trying and trying and trying and you just cannot fix it? That's when God's at his best, when we are at our weakest. When we're at our weakest, he gets to show his strength. Now that is a broad, bold, all-defining statement for God to say of himself, nothing is impossible with God. Now you would think, well, there's got to be something impossible. I mean, couldn't you, in your human finite mind, couldn't you think of something that even God couldn't do? But the Bible says nothing, absolutely nothing is impossible with God. And if you're a believer, that's your father. That's your God. That's your savior. That's your king. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. And the holy angel departed from her. Can we say that today? God, whatever your will is, whatever your will is, may it be done unto me as you say. But that doesn't sound too much like Americanized Christianity, does it? We kind of want to live where we live, and we want to drive what we want to drive, and we want to spend what we want to spend, buy what we want to buy, say what we want to say, watch what we want to watch, go where we want to go, love who we want to love, hate who we want to hate. Don't we kind of want to do our thing, but yet we still have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ through the gospel, and we know that God has saved us from our sins, and we realize that he's given us his mercy, grace, and love, and forgiveness, and we have salvation, and we're going to be with him in all eternity. But yet, I want to be Lord of my own life. I decide what I do. Oh, I can sing Amazing Grace. I can sing all the Christmas carols and hymns of the Christmas season. But when it comes to the living of my daily life, I'm the captain of my ship. That's not what Mary did. Don't you think God knew her heart before he chose her to be the mother of the holy child? She just said, do unto my body whatever you would want to do. That is an humble servant. That is a child of God that says, Lord, I'm totally yours. I'm totally yours. Are you totally the Lord's this Christmas season? Or is there part of you that hold back? Maybe you give 75% of your life to the Lord. But the other 25% reserved for those things that you don't want to give up. Or maybe you're a little more holy and righteous. Maybe you're 92% more given over to the Lord in submission. But maybe there's that 8% that you still, you know, you kind of live your own life. You have those own compartments in your closet that you are not willing to surrender to Christ. Mary knew no such way of life. This young girl, and remember, she's a teenager. Don't we give teenagers a hard time? We think it's the older people that are the awesome believers. This young teenage girl who's been keeping herself pure from men because she was not married. She had been living a righteous life and yet God's going to tell her now she's going to be a mom. She's going to become pregnant and she's not even married. And so what is the public going to think? That she has been promiscuous, that she has had sex outside of marriage and she is going to be in serious trouble and she will be disgraced. But you know what she says? Do unto me whatever it is that you want to do. My body's yours. My soul is yours. And therefore, my body is yours. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Here's four points from this sermon. Four points. Number one. Jesus' coming to be born to Joseph and Mary was not an afterthought of God. He didn't just go, you know what? Boy, things have really been bad ever since the days of Genesis, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and all the way through. And you get into Psalms and Proverbs there and all of the lament Psalms and things have been so bad. All the wars and all the fighting and all the turning away from God and having false gods that they worshipped. And, and then all of a sudden you come into this error where you have Rome, and the Rome has just uh, captivated and sieged this city. They're under the empire of Rome. Judah and Israel is under the empire of Rome. And so God didn't say, things are just so bad, I'm going to send a child. No, this was before the foundation of the world. This was in eternity before the heavens and the earth were ever created. God already planned at the right 
day and the right generation and the right husband and the right mother, this is who I'm going to give baby Jesus to. So number one, Jesus is coming to be born to Joseph and Mary was not an afterthought of God. It was specifically planned down to the night the baby was born. Number two, Jesus' coming as a baby was planned out well before the world was ever created. Number three, God has always wanted to come to earth to be with us in person. How did it start out back in the book of Genesis? God would walk with Adam in the cool of the day. He would come and walk. We know what walking's like. And if you've ever gone walking and you took a friend or you took your spouse or you took your child and you've walked with somebody, it's just pleasant, especially if you're walking at the same pace. You just talk. You just talk about various things and you laugh and you just enjoy each other's company and conversation, right? Well, that's what God did. He came and walked with the first people he ever created. He walked with them and talked with them. And it was a very special time. So God has always wanted to be in person with his people. And so we had Jesus leading the world from the heavenlies, but God has always said, a baby's coming, a baby's coming. I'm coming down there and I'm going to once again walk with you physically. Point number four, it may take thousands of years but God will always fulfill every prophecy he ever made. Therefore, you and I can fully trust him. If God can make a predetermined plan before the foundation of the world and then continue to remember that prophecy and continue to reveal it to people as the generations roll along and then he on a very specific night in a certain century, in a certain generation, in a certain country, bring it to bear over thousands of years. I can trust him. You can trust him. The word of God is totally trustworthy. Every word written in it was inspired by God for men to write. And he has always fulfilled everything he's ever promised. Has the baby Jesus changed your life? Besides just believing in Jesus, has the baby Jesus changed your life and what he stands for and what he represents? He wants to change every life. But for those people that have yet to believe in the baby Jesus or believe of the grown adult man Jesus grew up to be and died on the cross and paid for their sins, he still holds out to this day the offer of everlasting life. He offers the gift of life. The church has the answer for what's wrong in our sick, dying, evil, confused world. We have the truth. We know about the prophecy that's been fulfilled through the baby Jesus, the God-man that grew up, that sacrificed himself through cruel torture And then crucifixion on a cross. We have that answer. And that's what everybody you know. And I don't even have to know everybody you know. Everybody you personally know needs this Jesus. But they can only believe in this Jesus while they are alive or before Jesus comes back. So for you personally, have you trusted, fully believed in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation? For salvation is through faith alone, through grace alone, through Christ alone, plus nothing. That is salvation. You can't earn it. You can't get God's favor to shine upon you. You can't do enough good works. Has the baby, Jesus, changed your life? And if he has, how can we not take that change out into a world that needs the baby Jesus? Let's stand and let's sing.